Now this is an ECG from 21 years old male during his military test. So in this ECG, if you start from the lead one, two, three, the only of his finding is some sort of notching and ST elevation. In the inferior leads, somehow in the lead one and again in the recorded groups. So the young male who was completely asymptomatic and this was an incidental finding. So the most likely diagnosis in this case is early recordization pattern. So if this patient presents to us with syncope, then it will be early recordization syndrome. So now it's no more benign. So you have to write early recordization pattern or early recordization syndrome. So now the obvious findings in this case are concave ST elevation of less than 2 mm in precordial centimeters. Also you may uh, have noticed the J-point notching in the inferior leads, but yes, you may come across J-point slurry. There will be no reciprocal changes which will differentiate it with acute uh, uh, ischemias and there is no PR depression which will differentiate it from pericarditis. Now there are three types of early equalization uh, syndrome, type 1, 2 and 3. In type 1, the pattern will be found in only the later recording leads from B4 to B6, which is the low risk. In type 2, the pattern, early position pattern will be found in inferior and inferior lateral leads, which is high risk. In the type 3, which is rare, and in this scenario, we will find the early recordization pattern globally. And uh, they have the highest risk of when people raise me as. So again, the trait is autosomal dominant. So the currently available trait is only again for early recordization syndromes. ICD, yes, is indicated if the patient has cardiac arrest. And uh, this is the only channelopathy in which currently there is no consensus on family screen. So now this is the next ECG from a 22-year-old male with history of recurrent syncope. So almost there is no abnormality except for one thing, which is the QT. So the QT is prolonged in this ECG, so I have one more ECG. Again, there is no abnormality except for one thing, which is the QT. The QT is marked prolonged here. So the diagnosis is long QT1. So now for the, diagnosing the line, long QTs, the best leads are B2, B5 and B6. So always calculate the QTs in these leads. For long QTs, they may ask you about the triggering factors of the long QT1, long QT2 or long QT3. You must know the genes. For long QT1, the gene is KCNQ1, for 2, KCNH2 and for 3, SCN5A. So in the long QT1 and 2, there is loss of function and in long QT3, there is gain of function. They may ask you about the highest features of the long QT, which we will discuss later on. And uh, it's better if you should go through the drugs which are used to treat the long QT1, 2 and 3 and also the common drugs which prolong the QT. So that should be uh, avoided in these patients. Again, don't forget to write the family screening in these patients and also go through the syndromes which are associated with the long QT is like Jarvel and Vane syndrome, which is very important and usually asked. And uh, there is congenital deafness and descent tiring and Timothy syndromes. And also they may ask you uh, about the unmasking of the long QTs. So the exercise stress tests are used for unmasking long QT1 from 2 or differentiating the long QT1 or 2. And the second one is the epinephrine stress test. This is also used for concealed long QT1. Recommendation for ICD is the same as we have discussed. There is cardiac arrest, go for the ICD. The patient is symptomatic, go for the medical management. And if the patient is very much symptomatic on optimal dose of the beta blockers, go for the ICDs. And another new intervention is there, which is left cardiac sympathetic denervation, which we will also discuss later on. So this is a new intervention uh, for the patients with electrical storms, uh, 
whether because of the genopathies or because of the scars or those who present with recurrent ICD uh, symptoms. Now moving on to the next. So now the high risk features of the long QT. So if the QTC, credit QT is more than 500, this is one of the highest feature. Long QT 2 and 3 are the independent high risk uh, for a patient. Long QT 2 with female gender becomes high, very high risk and especially there is a risk of postpartum cardiac arrest and sudden cardiac death. Age less than 40 years is again a high risk feature with the patient starts experiencing the symptoms before the 10 years of the age. Again, this is a uh, high risk feature. If the patient had cardiac arrest or recurrent syncope, even though he is on drugs, this is also one of the high risk features. Now uh, you are seeing two ECGs, both are different, the upper one and the lower one. And uh, I have uh, put these ECGs uh, in combinedly because there is only a one obvious finding. In the lower one, and two obvious findings in the upper one. In the upper one, uh, you will not be able to appreciate any P waves, and the second very obvious finding is the Q and T interval. And in the lower one, there is only one obvious finding, which is for long QP interval in this one. So now it depends on the scenario. If you give, if they give you a scenario of a young patient, and he presents with syncope. The answer to the upper one will be short QT syndrome. And if they give you scenario for the patient who had uh, uh, like uh, a malignancy and there are two meds and he presents with syncope, so the answer will be hypergocene. And to the lower one will be most likely long QT or hypergocene. So the upper one was hypercalcemia, in which there is one obvious finding which is short QT interval. And you can also see the Osborne waves in these patients if there is severe hypercalcemia. So you must know the common causes for hypercalcemia, which are hyperparathroidism, bony mats, perineoplastic syndrome, or sarcoidosis. So the lower one was hypocalcemia, in which the obvious finding was prolonged ST segment, which results in QP program. And you must uh, also know the common causes of hypocalcemia because they can be given in the scenarios. Like after uh, thyroid surgery, pancreatitis, in hypothyroidism, or diabetes. And most of the times they gave hypocalcemia with hypercalcemia, in which you will see a long QT segment with tented T waves. Now, this is a scenario from 61 years old diabetic male before dialysis, and the ECG was this. So in this OECG, there is on obvious findings are tachycardia, which is sinus, there is left frontal branch, tall or peak T waves, and then again there is a notching in T waves. So basically, this is P, which is merging into T. So the PR interval is also prolonged in this ECG. The scenario, diabetic patient, and this ECG was taken before dialysis, points out, points out as towards the hyperkalemia. So the ECG shows sinus tag, left frontal branch block, there is right axis deviation, QT is prolonged, there is prolonged PR, peaked on tall T waves are also there, and sine waves can also be seen in severe hyperkalemia. So always look for the AV blocks, sinus arrest, and escape rhythms in patients with hyperkalemia, and they may ask you a question that Two sessions of dialysis was done for a patient in a week and he often presents with AV block due to hyperkalemia one day before the dialysis. So will you go for a PPM? So the answer is no. You will talk to the nephrologist and increase the dialysis sessions for that patient because hyperkalemia is a reversible cause. Now this is an ECG from 44 years old soldier and he was found unconscious in Siachen. So the answer is in the scenario, Siachen is a very good place. So if you go to the ECG, look at the template, one, two, there is a notching at the end of the QRS, there is marked bradycardia, you go through the uh, recorded leads, 
again there is a no change so the ecg is very much showing hypothermia so the findings are osborne or j waves other findings are bradyrrhythmias you can also see sinus bradyrrhythmy in this ecg or you may come across atrial fibrillation with slow ventricular rate or junctional rhythms or av blocks intervals may be prolonged like pr interval qt and qrs so don't forget to measure the intervals and also look for the shivering artifacts in ecg for hypothermia now moving on to the next ecg so this is ecg from 26 years old male with fever and chest pain so again the scenario young male he had fever and chest pain so now starting with the limb leads axis is normal but the obvious finding is there is concave type st elevation and look at the pr segment the pr segment is depressed and in the avr the pr segment is elevated and the st segment is depressed so this finding is same finding is there in the precordial leads also so with the scenario the ecg is conclusive of acute pericarditis so you are uh, you can observe the concave st elevation in this ecg there are pr depressions st depression and pr elevation in avr sinus tachycardia they may ask you about the causes for the acute pericarditis which are mostly the infection viral infection immunological uh, diseases like sld rheumatic fever uremia or they may give you a scenario of post mi patient having this ecg which is dressler syndrome trauma post cardiac surgery and post radiotherapy also go through the 2015 esc guidelines for further management for the drug therapies in acute and chronic pericarditis because they may ask you about the treatment plans so importantly this pericarditis has four stages i think uh, all of us uh, will be knowing that so the important thing is to differentiate the pericarditis from early ripoll syndrome so uh, there is a criteria that uh, you have to measure the sct wave ratio in lib v6 so if this ratio is less than 0.25 the diagnosis is a lipoprotein syndrome and if this ratio is more than 0.25 the diagnosis is pericarditis now moving on to the another interesting ecg so this is ecg from 65 year old female presented with dyspnea Three days after total hip replacement. So again, there is a clue in the scenario. The obvious finding, first of all, is the tachycardia. So there is sinus tachycardia, and if you look in the V1, there is right bundle, and the T waves are inverted in lead V1, two, and somehow in the lead V3. And I look at the lead three. There is Q. T wave is inverted in this, so the diagnosis is clearly pulmonary embolism in this patient. So the patient may present with sinus tachycardia or there may be SVT. In SVT is the common is atrial fibrillation, and the next common is atrial flutter and atrial tachycardia are also there. So the T wave inversions from V1 to V4 and in inferior leads are almost 98 percent specific for pulmonary embolism. according to a recent study so the very famous s1 q3 t3 are found in only 20% of the patients you may come across incomplete or complete rvb if there is complete rvb it shows increased mortality in that patient you may come across the excess deviation or you may see the people monel in these patients for management i would like you uh, all to look through the Latest guidelines, either AHA or ESC.